Well, first of all, I wanted to give a quick update on the weather. Uh, with severe winds and rain, we're seeing outages across the state. Uh, approximately 10,000 customers are without power, particularly in southern Vermont. Uh, Green Mountain Power, Vermont Electric Co-op, and Washington Electric Co-op are the primary utilities impacted at this time. Additional crews have been requested by Green Mountain Power from Canada, and our Department of Emergency Management is supporting that request. We expect the winds to continue to gust to 30 to 45 miles per hour much of the day today and then die down tonight, so more outages could come. Um, the temperatures will be uh, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, that's somewhat good news uh, in some respects. Uh, rain will continue in the Champlain Valley throughout the day, and a flood watch is still in effect for most of Vermont, except for the Northeast Kingdom, uh, until tomorrow morning. Uh, small streams have been impacted, uh, so water moves to the larger uh, rivers. Uh, so the Winooski, Otter Creek, and Mad Rivers are all expected to rise, uh, but we don't expect any widespread flooding as a result. So I want to thank the uh, utility crews for all the work they're doing and going to be doing, uh, as well as the local municipalities for their work, uh, and we're here to help, and we'll continue to update uh, as we move through the next couple of days. So now uh, to the task at hand. Uh, good morning. And thanks for being here today. It seems that uh, most are starting to recognize that Vermont has a workforce challenge. We still have around 14,000 fewer people working today than we did at our peak 10 years ago. I've made reversing this trend a top priority of my administration because we need more people here to fill the good jobs that we have available, to buy houses, put kids in our schools, uh, this will help lessen and spread the tax burden across a much larger population. We desperately need uh, more workers across all sectors. But a critical need is in the trades, because we won't have uh, homes to buy or roads to drive or bridges to cross or parks to visit if we don't have anyone to build them. And that's why I was pleased to sign a proclamation designated October as Careers in Construction Month in Vermont. This uh, proclamation uh, was requested by a contractor in Winooski, uh, VHV Company, who is here today, uh, because they and many others wanted to highlight the importance of the construction trades and the critical role they have in building all we have around us. Another goal was to increase awareness and interest, particularly among students uh, in pursuing uh, these uh, worthwhile careers. These are goals I share as someone who grew up in the trades and the construction business. We've seen a trend for decades where kids were, are pushed towards a traditional four-year degree. And these programs are important and valuable, but the unintended consequence is fewer kids seeking vocational careers, which are just as important because we need these professions to keep our, our state running and country running as well. We must strengthen our pipeline in these fields because 25% of construction workers in Vermont are over the age of 55, and 6% are over the age of 65. Think about that the next time you need a carpenter, a plumber, electrician. Uh, this is not a field where you want a shortage because when you call them, you typically really need them. And beyond the need, they're also good careers and ones uh, we should appreciate and take pride in, because reducing the stigma around the trades and blue-collar jobs is our collective responsibility. Part of that comes uh, with rethinking our education system from cradle to career, because as I've said before, whether it's a PhD or a CDL, all Vermonters deserve a path to meaningful employment. While we face challenges uh, to grow our pool of construction professionals, my team, along with our partners, are committed to helping Vermonters pursue this path and providing the training and skills to do so. We're here to talk uh, a little bit more about that uh, work, so I'd like to invite Secretary Curley at this time to share a little more about our needs in this sector. Secretary. Great. Thank you, Governor. I'm honored to be here today to, to celebrate the importance of careers in construction. I'd like to highlight how careers in construction and the construction industry as a whole contributes to a strong economy. The construction industry and the jobs that the industry provides represents an investment to our state's future. 
whether it's public works constructions like roads and bridges, things that serve the transportation needs for decades to come, healthcare facilities and schools for us to provide needed services to our residents, residential construction that contributes and provides our housing stock or commercial and industrial construction that supports all other sectors in the economy. The important work of the construction sector is work that we will benefit from year to year. In 2018, the construction sector alone employed more than 15,000 Vermonters, and total wage contributions were almost $780 million. These figures represent nearly 5% of the employment and wage totals for our state. In addition, we know there are many self-employed folks in the construction industry as well. In fact, in 2017, the Census Bureau reported more than 8,600 self-employed individuals in the construction sector, grossing an additional $495 million annually. Another way to look at the construction industry's incredible impact on Vermont is to look at the con contribution of construction to the state's gross domestic product. In 2018, construction provided $1.14 billion in GDP, which represented nearly 4% of the state's total, which is $33.7 billion. Construction workers possess all the skill sets needed to maintain and grow our infrastructure. Our construction workforce is aging, as the governor said, and we're focused on finding workers who possess the skill sets needed to fill these jobs. Focused efforts by the Agency of Education, the Vermont Department of Labor, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, along with construction associations, education and training providers, and employers in our state are working diligently and creatively to establish a pipeline of future construction workers. You'll hear more about these efforts from Deputy Edu Education Secretary Boucher, Acting Labor Commissioner Harrington, and President Moulton of VTC. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Secretary Boucher. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning to speak about our ongoing work at the Agency of Education to strengthen career pipelines in the construction trades, as Governor Scott uh, discussed. Um, as both governor, the governor and uh, Secretary Curley mentioned, we face today a critical shortage of skilled workers going into the construction trades. As part of the solution to that challenge, at the Agency of Education, we've been focused on developing specific career pathways in construction, beginning as early as middle school, as part of our broader effort to ensure that all students graduate from high school fully career and college ready, with all the skills they need to successfully make their next move after graduating. We've been executing on this initiative, as Governor Scott mentioned, as part of uh, the cradle to career vision that is a core part of uh, the governor's vision for Vermont's education system. And we've also been doing this work in partnership with our friends and colleagues at the Department of Labor, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and numerous other community stakeholders. In construction particularly, we hear consistently from employers that they need employees with a high level of skill and will pay high wages to those who have that skill set. Some of those positions can begin directly after high school, and some require additional trades-based post-secondary training or education. Our focus has been to help ensure that Vermont's Career Technical Education System, or CTE system, and our high school programs are designed so that students graduate with a clear knowledge of the skills required at entry, mid-level, and advanced levels of work in the construction trades. Students know what is needed and they know how to obtain additional work-based learning, internships, or additional training experiences should they need to pursue those opportunities. To that end, in 2018, we endorsed the National Center for Construction Education and Researches, better known as NCR, NCCER, excuse me, Introductory Craft Skills Curriculum for implementation in all 17 of Vermont's CTE centers. The NCCER curriculum is a program used nationwide that culminates in stackable credentials. If you don't know what stackable credentials means, um, these are uh, an accumulation of training sequences over time that taken together ideally prepare an individual for their specific occupation, um, including the capacity to shift either horizontally or laterally to uh, positions that um, are not, are, are sort of similar but need a, need a unique skill set, and eventually to shift vertically up in their career. 
Building stackable credentials typically occurs in a, a nimble, more flexible, just-in-time fashion than do traditional certification or licensure programs. We need all of these, but I think we really need to invest in some of these stackable credential um, offerings. Um, this uh, curriculum endorsement and adoption ensures that all of our employers in the construction trades can anticipate and bank on the same skill set for all of our graduating CTE students statewide. And it's also important to note that both employers and CTE faculty were critical participants and drivers of this work. And we were careful about uh, crafting this um, initiative that way because we wanted to make sure that we had buy-in and sustainability uh, for the approach. We also partnered with the Vermont Talent Pipeline um, to uh, carry this work, part of the Vermont Business Roundtable. Currently, we're working with each of the CTE centers across Vermont to implement this shared curriculum. Uh, the initial implementation went live last year in fall of 2018 for the entire school year. And I can't say, I, I'm not sure this would actually be meaningful for folks, but the fact that all of our CTE centers are doing the same thing in um, a particular uh, program of study is actually brand new to our state. Um, usually um, it's, it's very individualized um, at each particular local uh, CTE center. So we're actually moving now towards um, evaluating that, impl that implementation and ensuring that um, all of our instructors um, out in the field have the requisite skills to fully implement and to um, feel very comfortable about the next step in terms of ensuring that our students um, get uh, this particular educational curriculum. We're also working with CTE centers, our friends at Labor, uh, Vermont Technical College and Community College of Vermont to develop additional career pathways in the construction trades, expanding the roles of apprenticeships in trade programs, including plumbing, electrical, and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, all critical um, needs in our um, uh, state, um, broadly thinking of trades as uh, the governor mentioned, and making sure that the initial part of our construction trades pipeline provided at the secondary level, so before students actually graduate from high school, really making sure that aligns seamlessly with the latter aspects of the pipeline that are um, occurring in the form of re registered apprenticeships and post-secondary uh, certificate and degree programs across the state. In closing, I would just echo what uh, the governor and um, uh, Secretary Curley said in terms of not being able to say enough about the importance of this work for our economy statewide. It's a critical occupational field for Vermont and we all have more to do. Construction fields offer hands-on, high-paying jobs, in many cases to students just graduating from our CTE and apprentice programs, but also to those who are seeking um, additional training and certifications. And I believe our collaborative, complex work, relying on the active involvement of multiple state agencies, as you can see, as well as employers and educators, is really paving the way for the future of education in Vermont. It's offering clear opportunity and success for our students while simultaneously benefiting our construction employers and businesses. It's truly a win-win for all. Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce uh, Commissioner, Acting Commissioner um, Mike Harrington, who will share some perspectives from the Vermont Department of Labor. Thank you, everyone. I have some remarks here. I, but before I do, I just want to um, give a special thank you to the folks from Vermont Heating and Ventilation. Uh, it's because of um, their attention to this topic that we're here today. Uh, and um, I just want to say thank you for, for bringing us this opportunity so we can celebrate this today. And uh, thank you to the governor uh, for supporting this activity today. I have to imagine it probably wasn't a hard sell uh, to get him to sign on to this uh, proclamation. Um, but let me just say that the construction industry in Vermont uh, is vital to our economy and our workforce. Prior to the last recession, this industry accounted for about 17,000 jobs. However, over the past 10 years, we saw that drop, especially during the recession, of about 25%. In the height of the recession, that was in 2010. Since then, this crucial trade has seen steady growth and currently employs more than 15,000 Vermonters, as was mentioned earlier. While great progress has been made over the past decade, it is not enough. Construction has been and will continue to be a key industry in Vermont, and because of this, the state of Vermont and the Department of Labor continue to invest in training opportunities that advance the skills of those either already in the industry or looking to start a career in the industry. 
Specifically, Vermont has doubled its efforts with regards to apprenticeships. Through more direct efforts, specialized programs, and recent federal investments, the state's apprenticeship program is able to assist employers in building their future workforce. Currently, there are over 28 registered apprenticeship programs in the state of Vermont, and over the past 12 months, we've had almost 2,000 apprentices go through those programs. Of these apprentices, 70% have been in the construction fields. Through apprenticeship programs, employers can provide critical job training specific to their business needs while apprentices are learning valuable skills through on-the-job training. This model allows for existing and future workers to be better prepared for the current and future employment demands, all while earning a paycheck. Our priority remains to grow Vermont's economy and expand our state's workforce by continuing to invest in industries that are the backbone of this state. For employers who see this announcement, we would strongly encourage you to consider developing an apprenticeship program such as VHV at your own company or with a local educational institution, especially as next month we like to celebrate National Apprenticeship Week from November 11th through the 17th. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of our key apprenticeship partners, Pat Moulton, president of Vermont Technical College. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Commissioner Harrington. Thank you, Governor Scott, for uh, giving me the opportunity today. I also want to kudos to Vermont Heating and Ventilating for really bringing attention to the construction trades and to you, Governor, for stepping up and, and signing this proclamation to bring attention to such an important sector here in Vermont. And Vermont Technical College is honored to offer the Plumbing and Electrical Apprenticeship Program for the state of Vermont. We do that in partnership with the Vermont Department of Labor. We've had this excellent partnership for a number of years, and we deliver this training at 12 sites around the state. Sarah Ballou from our Continuing Education and Workforce Development Division is here, and that's the division that heads up the apprentice. She's very much engaged with the apprentices, and I'm always impressed at the employers who support these students and the students themselves, as Sarah and I were chatting. They're going to work all day, they're coming to class in the evening, they're coming to class on Saturday, they're juggling family and everything that goes with it but they know that that's going to end up in a really lucrative career that enables them to afford the quality of life that's so important to them. And the construction industry and the related trades provide that opportunity for Vermonters, in many cases, as the governor points out, without a degree, but we also have opportunities for degrees in the construction trades. Our construction project management program gives students the education they need to lead large commercial, industrial, and other building projects around the state. As excuse me, uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher mentioned, the Career and Technical Education Centers are an excellent place for students to launch that career and, and that career pathway. And we're working with CTE centers to build direct pathways to our degree programs. And we're looking at other opportunities beyond construction project management where we can offer additional certificate and or degree programs. We offer an auto technology and diesel technology program, which is also critical to the construction trade. Somebody's got to keep the machinery working. Our architectural engineering technology program is teaching students how to design and build energy efficient buildings of the future, technologies we probably can't even envision right now. Our civil engineering associate's degree prepares graduates for careers in road, bridge, and other infrastructure construction fields, which is so critical. And we work very closely with the Vermont Agency of Transportation to prepare students for careers at VTRANS and in the construction trades. VTRANS sponsors every year for us a bridge building contest that we do for middle and high school students where they literally build a bridge out of popsicle sticks, dental floss, and Elmer's glue. And if you ever want to have a good time, come down to the bridge building contest because especially the middle schoolers, they have uniforms, they decorate their bridges, and we have a machine that actually smashes the bridges and will register the amount of weight and support and we've had a middle school class come up with a bridge that sustained over 2,000 pounds of pressure out of popsicle sticks and glue and dental floss. Those are the future engineers of tomorrow. 
And we do that to try to introduce students to these lucrative careers. In fact, just today, Governor, we have over 700 young ladies on our campus in Randolph Center for the Women Can Do Conference. This is an opportunity where we introduce young ladies to non-traditional careers in construction, engineering, law enforcement, firefighting, you, you name it. Um, it's always a gorgeous day for when these girls come to campus for Women Can, can Do, but they just bully on through because that's what women do. And we're very pleased to do that in construction, in conjunction with Vermont Works for Women, the McClure Foundation, the Vermont's Women's Fund, and the Agency of Education. And VTrans is there this morning with trucks and, and machinery and introducing students to the opportunities. Our continuing education and workforce development and the division is also engaged in green building trainings uh, that we can certify folks to do uh, building inspections and other green building techniques. The division also is working again with NCCR, you'll notice a theme here, offering a credentials project supervision course in the construction trades to become site certified leaders. We offer a number of summer camp opportunities to young people to experience and, and experiment with various careers. Our Rosie's Girls STEM Leadership Camp at our Randolph Center campus engages young, le young ladies in leadership development around science, technology, math, and engineering, the STEM fields. We will be offering again this year the National Summer Transportation Institute, working with VTrans, at, and it will be at our Randolph and Williston campuses. We have some information on the table. This provides young men and women the opportunity to explore careers in transportation through awareness of the complex transportation systems we've all come to rely on. And we offer other summer camps for middle and high school students in computer programming, aeronautics, and more. These are, there are excellent opportunities in the construction sector in Vermont, and Vermont Tech is proud to prepare students to, to launch those careers through certificates as well as degree programs. And we're pleased to continue to partner with the state of Vermont in expanding our apprenticeship programs and expanding opportunities for young people in this trade. It is lucrative, and there are many opportunities. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pat. And you do tremendous work there at VTC and uh, continues to be a staple in, the, uh, in this profession. Um, at this point, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the subject at, uh, at hand, then we can get into other questions if you'd like after. It seems, Governor, since the day you took office, the demographic challenge has been at the top of your list. Yeah. I mean, is there any place in Vermont where there isn't a demographic challenge? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, and, and that's uh, part of our struggle and part of our challenge. And when you look back at, uh, I, I talk about this a lot, 30,000 fewer kids that we have in our schools from 20 years ago, um, that has a ripple effect uh, across our state colleges as well as in all sectors. And I think it really does impact the trades in particular, uh, because they're the ones that stay here in Vermont. And, and we're not having, we, we've somewhat lost the crop. So we have to find uh, approaches, ways uh, to, to entice, uh, to bring more people into the, into the state, uh, whether it's with uh, immigration or whether it's with some of the state-to-state -state programs and, and so forth that we've, we've been encountering as well as the, you know, the military uh, pensions that I keep talking about, that we should, we should stop uh, taxing military pensions because we want people, after they retire from the military, they're in their, their prime uh, and they can come back into the workforce. So they, they pay attention to who taxes and who doesn't. We're one of just a handful of states, under 10 at this point, uh, that continues to tax uh, their, their pensions uh, so they don't come here. So we have to find other opportunities every way we can uh, to attract more people into the state. And affordability is part of that. Um, do you have a sense of how many construction jobs are open right now that aren't filled? Um, I, I, Mike might be able to answer this, but, uh, but I would every sector is impacted. And I would say that uh, there is not a construction company in Vermont that isn't looking for help. But I don't know if you have any statistics. The only thing I would say is um, we did go back into the numbers and look at this, but the it's such seasonal work and it fluctuates so much that it's hard at any one given time to be able to track how many positions are open. For instance, right now, um, you know, we're we're on the downward side of the construction season, um, so that changes and skews the numbers. Um, and I, but the thing I would also point out is we don't typically think of all the ancillary construction. Uh, 
of jobs that are out there too. So when we talk about flaggers uh, and GIS and, and other things of that nature, they're not, um, I don't think we think about them as construction work, but um, they are part of that cohort of people. It sounds like <clears throat> you were talking about the, the folks that are in the pipeline to mm -hmm. sort of become involved in the trades and yeah. the construction trades in Vermont. I mean, are you, obviously we have a demographic issue. There aren't enough people, young people sort of in our school systems, but as far as things are going right now, are you satisfied with the number of people that are, it sounds like it, the answer is no based on this, but I guess what is the goal uh, for like the number of um, students in college and or high school you'd like to see? Yeah, well, I, we'd always like to see more. Uh, I think there's, um, it's in my mind, a, a two issue. One is internal uh, within our state and then external. How do we bring more people to our state? So for me, I think there's always, we always see a demand. Uh, we can always put more people into the funnel and into the system. Um, you know, we would, uh, when we talk about reversing the trend uh, and, and bringing more people in, it's not just about going to a net neutral. Uh, we need to be in a net positive. Uh, and so um, while we talk about losing, um, you you know, 6,000 people out of our, our workforce and our schools, that, that actually equates to us needing to attract more than that um, to begin to rebuild, um, you know, the, the funnel and the people in our system and in our uh, going through our program. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite a feat, but I, you know, we're, we're working diligently and, and um, I think we've seen progress and, and we'll continue to see progress. Well, again, with a 2.1% unemployment yeah. rate, uh, the lowest in the in the country. Yeah. Uh, you with, said at the beginning, do you think too many young people are going to school for four-year degrees? Um, well, I think there are other opportunities. I think that we uh, we should be looking to make sure that we um, uh, utilize the two-year programs as well as uh, some of the the industry themselves have have uh, stepped up to the plate and and. It, provided training in different ways. I think there's other approaches that we'd be taking. Traditionally, everyone looked at uh, a four-year program. Uh, I'd say uh, Vermont Technical College, uh, in its history, uh, had uh, two-year degrees, associate degrees, and could go on to a four-year uh, program uh, at that point. I've had numerous friends that went for civil engineering at uh, VTC and went from there from a two-year program uh, to a four-year at uh, UVM. But I, I also know many who went through the, the two-year um, uh, civil engineering program who work for the state right now mm -hmm. in, in VTrans. So um, I just think that we, uh, we have to, uh, to, to think outside the box. We have to, to continue to find different approaches and, and not use the, the four-year uh, uh, degree as a barrier uh, for, for those interested in the trade. It, it isn't always the answer. If I, if I may, yeah, too, sure. add, I, at Vermont Tech, we have certificates, which are one-year programs. We're building more. Uh, CCV, also Community College of Vermont's engaged in certificate programs. And often that's really all you need to get out and into the, into the trades with a certificate. And then sometimes students get, the, get bitten by the bug and want to go on and get their associate's degree or bachelor's. But it's important, and I agree with the governor, it's important to offer all kinds of pathways for students. Maybe you can't afford a four-year degree right out of the gate. A certificate or associates is a great way to start. Engaging in the apprenticeship programs. We're launching new apprenticeship programs in various um, accounting, healthcare, and construction, and industrial maintenance. Those are great opportunities. You earn and learn at the same time. Well, so the, there's always room for a four-year degree, but there's always lots of other options. Again, I think what you've done uh, with the apprenticeship program in conjunction with the state uh, is a model for other sectors as mm -hmm. well. Absolutely. I mean, these are, if you go to the, to the graduation, which I've done for the last number of years, and these are uh, people who are, are working uh, during the day, and they're going to classes at night. It might take them uh, years to accomplish, uh, but they're committed. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and it's really rewarding to see uh, the families who are there uh, and these, uh, these, these uh, employees uh, coming up through the ranks and, and wanting to better themselves. So this has been, whether it's in electrical or, or plumbing, um, there's other opportunities as well for apprenticeships. I guess, does any of what needs to happen involve changing our or expanding our vocational offerings, or is this more about getting people here? Uh, it's, it's a little bit, a bit of both. Um, um, trying to, to blend, uh, I believe. Uh, I, you know, I was in, uh, when I went to Spalding, I did, uh, 
I was in the vocational program in the afternoons uh, because I loved to build and craft and create things. So, and I really liked to do that. So I went in and entered the program in the afternoons uh, for two years. I was in the machine trades program. Uh, and then I do my college prep in the mornings. But there's a certain stigma that was attached to that. I didn't feel a part of either. Uh, I felt as though uh, those in, in the college prep in the mornings wondered why the vocational kid was here with them in the, in the mornings. And in the afternoons, uh, they looked at me differently because I was in the, in the other wing uh, in the morning. So it's, uh, there's a stigma uh, that does exist. Uh, I think it's up to us to try and blend that, to, to combine, that it's not uh, just for those who can't make it in one area or the other. It's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity and, and a very rewarding. And then these are, these are highly paid jobs at this point because of supply and demand. Uh, and as they can attest to, I mean, they're, they're living this. Uh, Vermont Heating and Ventilating, I'm sure you're looking for help today, correct? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> How many would you, could you take today? Probably six or seven. Yeah. So every company is looking for help right now. Can I actually add to that too? Sure, come on in, Heather. Um, so uh, I think, I think um, one of the real key pieces is we're starting introducing students to these uh, CTE programs early on. So in seventh grade, they're starting to learn about these particular options. Um, the other thing, I, don't, um, I talked about the shared curriculum. I think part of the um, strategy with that is that we have very, usually CTE regional centers have very tight connections at the local level, and they're able to work closely. But we want a system where students who graduate from any of those tech centers can actually go around the state and could actually um, be employed um, to, to make to, to fill some of those gaps that are that are where you folks are, even though they're, they've been trained in the South, for instance. So I think that's part of what we're doing around that systemic change too. Thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the topic? But you're welcome to stay, um, but uh, I'd be happy to take any other questions or try to answer any other questions you might have. Oh, what's been the, the rea re your the reaction within the Republican Party, both statewide and nationally, to your thoughts on the impeachment issue? Um, to be honest, I haven't heard uh, back from any any officials within within the party. Uh, or for that matter, uh, any other governors uh, who happen to be Republicans. Uh, we certainly have a number of people on uh, both sides of the aisle calling in uh, to the governor's office, either uh, thanking or, or voicing their displeasure uh, for uh, any action I might take. But, uh, but officially, I have heard nothing from anyone else. I mean, I've seen some not so nice things in some of the national media, the national conservative media. Um, you don't pay attention to those? I try not to, right. You know, I, I'm just trying to do what I think is right. Um, I've, I've explained it. I feel as though I'm, I'm like an umpire or a judge. I just call, the, call them the way you see them uh, and uh, try and be honest about that and forthright. I think we have an obligation as political leaders within our own states uh, throughout the, the country. We see so much polarization, so much divisiveness uh, that we have an obligation to reinstill that faith and trust that's been lost. People want to have faith in their government. And we as leaders have a responsibility to just tell the truth and be as transparent as we can, uh, regardless of the ramifications. You know, who knows what will happen in the next election for, for anyone. So. Uh, but, but while you're in office, uh, you take an oath uh, to uphold the Constitution uh, as well as to do your best uh, for your constituents. And, and, uh, and that's, that's all I try to do. Um, you might have seen Senator Ash recently sent a letter to the Treasurer urging her to divest our um, pensions from uh, fossil fuel uh, companies' um, investments. And I'm um, just wondering if you would ever support that if that's something you uh, want to look at after GMP? Uh, yeah, I, I thought the, that was uh, interesting, uh, GMP uh, divesting. I think this has been a, a topic of conversation. Uh, the, uh, obviously, this is under the purview of the treasurer, uh, and uh, I'm sure she'll take this seriously. would be happy to, uh, to talk with her uh, about that, but, um, but again, 
I think she has a, a, a responsibility as well to oversee that, and, and that's her. She'll so make a decision on that. I, I would defer to her. I mean, in, in, in theory, do you think it's a good idea? I think, I think again, she has a responsibility uh, to, uh, to the pensions and, and retirement funds and so forth, so she's trying to do the best she can to make sure that we're, we're uh, able to pay uh, those pensions in the end. And, and, you know, we're having that debate. Uh, we've had this debate for the last number of years about uh, the, the lack of, uh, of uh, the underfunding uh, of our pensions and, and our liabilities. So uh, this falls within that. So she's, she's got a tough uh, balancing act. So but, she determined that it was risky to pull those investments? You well, they, they were apparently, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to speak for her. I think it's a better question for her, but obviously she's trying to do the best she can uh, balancing uh, those uh, funds that are lucrative uh, with those who, who aren't, which aren't, and, and trying to do whatever she can to make sure that she maintains that balance. We're seeing some pretty big headlines overseas right now. The U.S. pulling troops uh, out of Syria. Um, it's gotten mixed messages from mixed reactions from both sides of the aisle. Uh, where do you stand? Well, I, I mean, I, again, I, I I think they've weighed in. Uh, we saw this in in Congress uh, yesterday, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, it's a bipartisan a reaction uh, to. To the withdrawal out of uh, out of Syria and, uh, and Syria, Turkey, uh, the Kurds, and uh, and I and I think that uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, voice uh, their displeasure in, in the way it was done. Whether we should be out of there or not uh, is is an, a separate question. Uh, and I think the most would say we need to, we need to bring our troops home. But how you do that is important. And I, and I believe that we saw that rebuke. Uh, yesterday with uh, with Congress and, and across party lines. Have you had a discussion with the Attorney General or the Attorney General's office regarding the new public records policy? Uh, I have not. Um, obviously, I uh, spoke with, uh, I think that was reported, I spoke with my cabinet uh, about this on Tuesday. Uh, and will, you know, it seemed clear to me, the Supreme Court decision seemed clear. Uh, that we we aren't going to we're not going to charge if someone has a uh, a camera and wants to take pictures of any documents they're public documents uh, and they uh, we have an obligation to to follow the law so it seemed clear to me. Um, I think your office had said or you had said that there is a, some sort of clarifying guidance coming on this. Well, we, we, yeah, we need to, to make sure. I mean, I, I spoke uh, at the from from this position to the cabinet, um, but I we need to put it in writing. Uh, so I'll be working with uh, Secretary Young on this and uh, make sure that everyone understands uh, what position we're in and where uh, where we're supposed to go so that we're consistent. I, I think that's important. The consistency across the administration is important. I mean, how does that work if the AG says it's going to go one way and you say it's going to go another? Well, we have a responsibility for the administration um, and they will follow whatever we determine uh, that they should do. So, uh, but, but the AG um, can can do uh, what he wants within within his organization, but uh, we're we're taking a different tact. Both the Attorney General and um, the Secretary of State have suggested creating a new position that would, or a new office that would deal with these public records requests and sort of um, relieve the burden. I guess. Uh, I mean, where where do you stand on? Well, that? I'm not I'm not looking to grow the bureaucracy any further than it is right now. To be honest with you, I think we can handle this within house. I, I don't know why. Uh, we would need a whole new office to do this. All right. Thank you very much.